Well, welcome back to The Pew, everybody. I'm your host, John Edwards, and I'm excited to once again be bringing you another episode of Just a Guy in the Pew. Now, look, Victor's out this week. He couldn't make it. His schedule was kind of crazy this week. So I'm bringing you this episode solo. Well, welcome back to The Pew, everybody. I am your host, John Edwards, and I'm super excited to be bringing you another episode of Just a Guy on the Pew. Now, look, Vic's out this week. He had some stuff going on, so I'll be in here solo today. But the Lord has really put some stuff on my heart that I wanted to share with you, and that's why I went ahead and did this episode solo. It's been some stuff that has just profoundly impacted me over the last couple weeks and months, and I thought that it might be a blessing to you in your life, too. So that's why we're in here doing this solo episode today, and I hope that you enjoy it. We'll jump into it here in a second. But first, I want to talk to you about two very, very important things. First, registration is now open for our Eucharistic Miracles pilgrimage to Italy. Folks, I'm super excited about that. I, I just I, I fell in love with pilgrimage when I went on that trip with Father Larry to the Holy Land two months ago as a leader. And I just, the relationships we made, I mean, we, we're we still in contact with all 71 of the pilgrims. We're in a daily chat group with them. Some of them recently visited Memphis for Dr. Bob's conference we put on a week ago, as you heard on the last episode with Dr. Bob. And we got to catch up with them and made so many memories then and just it, it, so many friendships that'll last and just had the blessing of visiting so many holy spots. Well, I, I couldn't wait to schedule another pilgrimage. So Italy made sense to go to next. I've always wanted to go to Italy. Always wanted to see all the churches and cathedrals and the Vatican and all those things. And that's what we're going to do. But the cool thing is it's not just a regular trip. We're going to see the site of Eucharistic miracles. I believe we're going to see two of them, if not three. And I'm super excited about that. You're also going to have the opportunity to walk in the footsteps of great saints like St. Saint Padre Pio, St. Peter, St. Paul, St. Francis, St. Clair, St. Ignatius. Uh, St. Augustine, St. Catherine of Siena, right? We're also going to see Blessed Carlos Acutis, and we're going to go to Rome and, and Assisi and uh, Soriano and Laciano and, and Laredo and Pompeii and Isle of Capri and Orovito and just all these other amazing places. I cannot wait to go. And the cool thing is our spiritual director that's going to be joining us is Father Joe uh, Sachs. And he is from here here in Memphis. He's a local priest. He lived in Italy for 23 years. So not only does he speak fluent Italian, not only is he an amazing homilist, but he has extensive uh, knowledge of the area. So it's going to be such a gift to have him traveling with us. Now look, folks, the, the trip opened a week ago, and already we have half of it full. Right? We have 25 spots left, but I know it's going to be going fast. We've got some email marketing going out. We've got some parish things going out. Uh, so I know that the trip's going to fill up fast. So if you desire to go with us, which trust me, we desire to have you go with us, then you need to go to our website and look at signing up. You can do that by going to justagotinthepew.com. The events and book me uh, link is at the top of the page. Once you click that, you'll see in the middle of that next page, uh, all the information about the trip. You can also go to Select International Tours, which is our wonderful pilgrimage partner. And in the search bar on their site, search my name, John Edwards. It'll pull up the page. You can download the PDF about the trip and all the information and register there as well. So again, if you want to join us, you need to go ahead and jump on and online and get registered because it is selling out quickly. Folks, we cannot wait to go. We cannot wait to meet you. So please go sign up today and join us in Italy on June 3rd through the 14th of 2024. Now, the second important thing, folks, we're hiring. We have just hired an admin. We've just hired a part-time development director. And now I want to bring on some missionaries. But folks, we took a risk hiring the two people. Uh, we're not floating in money over here. I can tell you that. Every dollar helps. Right now, we support the ministry by traveling twice a month. And folks, there is so much demand, I can't handle it by myself. I made a promise to Angela I'd only travel twice a month, and I want to keep, and I aim to keep that promise to her. So the only way we can meet the demand of over 80 parishes that have submitted for us to come work with them to start men's groups is to bring on people and to train them to help in the ministry, whether it's the admin, the development director, or the missionaries. I want to bring on folks that have a gift of speaking, and I want to bring on folks that can help go and, and do these missions in parishes and train these leaders that have a heart for bearing fruit that lasts. Now, I've already got some folks in mind and some folks I'm talking to, but we need the resources to be able to bring them on. We can't do it by ourselves. So many of you give graciously every single month, and we thank you and we appreciate that. Appreciate you for that. But we need benefactors and we need monthly supporters now more than ever to move forward in this great work. It's not only the 80 uh, parishes on the list. We've also been in conversation with three different large dioceses that have 
over 350 parishes combined that are also looking for us to go and serve their parishes. So folks, God is blessing us with opportunities, but we need help. We need resources. So look, this isn't some Patreon account. This isn't going to give me a paycheck. This is going to bring other people into the work that we're doing. And I always tell people, as I did at a benefactor lunch the other day with a guy, I told him, look, I don't just want your money. I invite you to come on as a partner in this mission, right, as a friend of the ministry, and to really take joy in the work that's being done and know that you're a huge part of that. So folks, if you want to be a part of something that is changing the church, we get emails each and every week from members and groups that we've started that their lives are starting to change and their parishes are changing, their relationship with their wives are getting better and with their children. And it's just amazing to see. I had a 93-year-old man come up to me at one of our last event and told me that he had lost two wives, buried two wives, and a child in his life. And that he'd been sitting there for 10 years wondering why God kept him alive, right? Why he was still in existence. And he told me, young man, after this mission and the potential of what this men's group has, I know my purpose now is to go and share with others what you shared with me this weekend. And he had the biggest smile on his face. And the group tells me he's there every single week mentoring and being a blessing to men that are younger than him. Folks, this is bearing fruit that lasts and it's changing lives. So if you want to be a part of that, if you want to help us to move forward and, and to grow to be able to meet the demand, then please consider becoming a monthly supporter or a generous benefactor at a high level. We need all of it. But you can go to our website at justagotinthepew.com, and on the main page, there's a button that says support. You can click that button, go right online. You can fill out, become an annual, uh, 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 twice a year, a monthly uh, donor and benefactor. That's what we need. You can also find out there how to send us a check if you'd rather do that. But you can go to justagotinthepew.com or donorbox.org slash pew to move forward in becoming a supporter. Trust me, it will bless our ministry beyond recognition, beyond any amount of thanks I could give you, and it will help us to move forward to, to bring on the people we need to do the work that God's called us to do. It's very hard for me to do this at the beginning of, of each episode. It's hard for me to ask for support, but folks, it's gotten to the point where I can't do it myself. I'm either going to gonna die young or be unsuccessful and try to keep up with the demand. So folks, please consider becoming a supporter, and you do that again by going to justagotinthepew.com or donorbox.org. So thank you as always to listening to that. It takes me a long time to get it out, but I hope that you see the passion and the need that we have there, and you want to be a part of helping us move forward. So folks, I want to jump into the episode. This week's going to be called The Love of a Father. And, and you know, I got to tell you, it was such a blessing to have Dr. Bob here and to do that episode with him last week. And I also did one with his brother, Bart, which we'll put out next week, um, which will be the following Tuesday after this one. And I'm excited for you all to hear that. But, you know, I, I always get this great experience whenever I go to one of Bob's Healing the Whole Person uh, conferences. He trusts me to play a role in a sculpt. And what do I mean by that? Bob ha- believes it's something called Lectio, or not Lectio, but Visio Divina. And it says, it's like Lectio Divina, except you're seeing something in front of you that helps you visualize and, and helps something become more real to you than maybe it has in the past when you're trying to figure these things out yourself. So he does this sculpt that involves three people in the beginning. It's, it's Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Now, my friend and good, uh, good friend in my life, Father Gio, the priest you've heard me talk about a lot on here, he was Jesus, I was God the Father, and Kim from the JP2 Healing Center was the Holy Spirit. Now, Bob picked uh, Max and his wife, who's been on our show before, uh, to come into the, uh, into the sculpt as Adam and Eve. And basically, we all just embrace them. And it's supposed to show us before the fall. Right? It's supposed to show that everything was perfect and in great unity because I'm holding on with my arms and my 6'8 wingspan around Jesus and the Holy Spirit who are embracing Adam and Eve, and my arms are going around everybody. And it's a beautiful depiction in front of 800 people of what it's supposed to look like when we're in proper union with the Holy Spirit, with God the Father and the Son. We're in that great union with, with the Holy Trinity. And that that's what it was like in the garden before the fall. Just great love, just being in this circular motion between the Trinity and being poured down into Adam and Eve. But Bob takes them out of the out of the sculpt to illustrate the fall. And he pulls Adam and Eve on opposite sides of the of the altar up there, and their back is turned towards us. And I could tell you as playing the role of the Father, seeing them being ripped out of that warm embrace and being pulled out, Adam and Eve both start saying things every single time. Different people play in those roles and the times I've done it, they always say, say things like, I'm cold, I'm lonely, I'm isolated, I long to be back into their embrace. And as the father playing that role, their back is to me and all I want 
is for them to look at me, right? To turn around and see that I'm not disgusted with them, to see that I'm not angry with them, to see that that I don't want to punish them, that all I want is for them to look at me so they can see my love and come back into that embrace. Folks, it's powerful. And it goes on through the next couple of nights and they eventually wind up back in the embrace because the second night I'm holding up Jesus, Father Geo, in, in that circumstance, arm like a cross and Bob is bringing the sins and the wounds from those people back to Jesus and eventually Adam and Eve come back into right order into that, into that embrace of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and everything is right. Bob interviews the audience and he interviews us during this whole um, sculpt and depiction. And I got to tell you, it's just so... It's so incredible to hear the comments of people. One guy stood up and he's like, I just want a hug from John. And I was like, buddy, you'll get one as soon as I'm off the altar. And I meant it. But other guys in seriousness and women, they just pour out how how disgusted they feel with themselves and how far away they feel from the father and how a lot of that comes from their own father wounds, not having a good father, not having good relationships in their life. But so many people just simply believe that they're not worthy of God's love. And I saw it poured out all weekend, and this is why I'm sharing it as we jump into the episode, is that, I mean, I, I, I kid you not, I guarantee you I, I hugged probably 100, 120 people throughout the whole weekend. I'm playing the role of God the Father, and I'm walking to the bathroom, or I'm walking to check on the volunteers and see if anybody needs anything, and people, men, women, we had 40 Dominican sisters there, and even some of them came up and just stopped me and said, that was so powerful. I don't know what it, it what it feels like to feel the Father's embrace. Would you please be okay with me giving you a hug? And I got to tell you, some of these folks would come up and they would just bury their head in my chest. And when I would wrap my arms around them, they would just weep. I mean weep, like cry and shake and convulse because they just they didn't know what it felt like to feel the Father's love. And in that moment... They were feeling it. They were feeling that, that embrace. And look, I don't have a God complex. I know I'm not God the Father, so please don't hear it like that. But it was such a blessing to be able to, to grab somebody who was a total stranger who's never felt that love and be able to just hold them and be there for them. And, and, and so many times during those embraces, the Lord whispered to me things to say like, He loves you. He's not disgusted with you. You're worthy and you don't have to do anything to earn it. Please look back at the Father. Like, please, like, cast out these lies that you're hearing about yourself and look up. Quit looking down and look up. And people would just break into sobs. And it was such a gift to receive that and to 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 be a, a vessel of the Father's love in that way for somebody. But it got me to thinking about my own life. And, you know, I've spoken about my father wounds here and how I wasn't ever really you know, just showered with that growing up. My my father never really said, I love you or I'm proud of you until I was much older. I love my father, as I've said before, and as I said with Bob, I, he wears a cape in my life and in my eyes. But man, for a long time in my life, I never felt what it was like to be truly loved by a father. And when when you haven't felt that, it's incapacitating and it it keeps you from moving forward in your relationship with God because you simply don't believe that you're worthy, right? We transpose the relationship we have with our Father on God the Father, whether we know that or not. And and it just really showed me this past weekend with that conference just how many father wounds so many of us have and how common it is. And it hits home about how important proper love and blessing of a father really is. It is so powerfully important. And, and, and for many of you that are Spider-Man fans, you're going to recognize this thing I'm going to say next. But it is a great gift and a great power that we've been given as fathers to pour into our children and to bless them. But with great power comes great responsibility, guys. And and the thing is, like we have the power in our hands to bless, to to lift up, to encourage. Or the terrible part about it is we also have the power to tear down, to demolish and destroy. I mean, that's just the truth. I have, man, for so long, like I swore that I would never like say some of the things that my father said to me to my children. But so many times, guys, I know you've had this happen in your life and you felt this regret immediately. I have just, I've let the words of my father come out of my mouth. I've let the situation or, or how physically I feel in the moment or the annoyances of life get in the way of the way of me being the father I should be in my, in front of my child and to my child. I've allowed that moment of grace and blessing to turn to, to condemnation and to anger and to, to just a berating about the mistakes they've made. 
And it hurts me as I look back because I spent many years doing that. In my own addictions, in my own struggles, I spent many years wasting the, the power that I had in my hand and not bestowing the blessing of a father and loving my child the way I should have, my children the way I should have, but being the opposite of that. And it's, it's so easy to forget the influence of, that we have of those around us, especially our children, and, and it's tremendous, and we often wield it so carelessly. You know, John Paul II said this. He said, in revealing and in reliving on earth the very fatherhood of God, a man is called upon to ensure the harmonious and united development of all the members of the family. Like, this is the role, fellas. But but how many times do we do we allow ourselves to be focused on ourselves, our needs, our desires, our disappointments? Right? We focus on how tired and frustrated and irritated we are at our situation in the moment. You know, it, it's we miss the opportunity of every moment we have to positively impact our children. We miss the occasions to bless them, and instead we tear down. Right? We let we let and look. We all know how this feels like when things hadn't been going your way at work, and all your kid wants is a hug and to, to tell you about his day. And we blow him up. I'm too busy, or not right now, or I've got to finish work, or or things like that, and it and it and it, and it flows into so many aspects of our relationship with our children. It's not just about our own selfishness, even though that could play a role, but oftentimes, like we just we hand down the wounds that we've been handed, right? I mean, just like with sports. I mean, my dad, I love him to death, and you guys have heard this before, but you know, he always spent his time telling me what I did wrong, never lifting me up, never saying, "Hey, you did this great," but there's this one thing here that looks like you're struggling with, and let me help you with that. No, mine was more of if you'd done this right, you wouldn't have missed that. If you'd done this, if you just practice more like I told you to, you might actually be good things like that that I used to hear that I swore I'd never do to my children. And guys, like, if we're not paying attention to this, then we're missing out and we're going to build places of woundedness in our children. Now, look, I don't want you to mishear me and go, we don't need to correct bad behavior or we don't need to have discipline in the, in the lives of our children. I'm not saying that, but I'm simply getting you to stop and look at what the Lord's had me looking at. And what he's been saying to me is, John, you have so many opportunities, moments each and every day that are that are limited, by the way. Our children are never going to be at home. And, and even if they're not at home, we have limited reactions with them when they're grown and they have their own kids. But we never lose the power of a father's influence over our children, right? I mean, how many times, like my dad called me the other day and he said, I just was thinking about it, about you, and I wanted to tell you I love you. And I immediately felt my spirits lift because it means something to have the blessing of the Father. It means something to receive the love of the Father. But guys, so many of us are wasting that, and I know I have, because we're too concerned about ourselves, and we're too caught up in the moments that we're facing in our job or in the stresses of our life. We're trying to figure out how we're going to pay bills or whatever's going on that we simply take it out on our children. Like we don't know how to, how to step aside from that and embrace those moments to love our kids. Right, it happened to me right before I was about to 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 do this podcast. I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm trying to get started four or five times. I'm having to go over there and restart because I'm in here by myself. And and Jacob texted me something and I went in the house. I was like, "What, man? I'm trying to get a podcast done." And then I thought, "I'm trying to get a podcast on how to give you love better and how to be a better father." And here I am failing again in this moment as I'm about to go turn the mic on and tell other men about it. Now, I wasn't planning on saying that, but the Lord wanted to be honest and open about where I am in my life. I still continue to struggle with that too, right? Just because I'm out here helping people doesn't mean I got it all figured out in my life. That's some of the best podcasts we ever do, I think, is when God is showing me that I'm not living well when I'm telling people to live. And then I can come in here and tell you that the experience I've had and humility, hopefully, and share with you so hopefully you can learn from it as well. But folks, like like I said, I mean, so many times we're we're focused on ourselves. And and the funny thing about it is, like so many of us, we, we spend our times longing for and working towards gaining what power and position and, and influence over people and things. And and we don't realize the fact that we already have it. Like that the greatest power and 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 influence we could ever have in our life was given to us the moment we heard our first child cry. Right, the, the the first moment we heard that 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 sweet noise from our child, God was giving into our protection a young child to help develop and grow. And and we know what kind of father God is. 
Many of us may not feel that in our lives, and we talk about that all the time, but if you really spend time in Scripture, and in those moments where God is presenting himself to Jesus in front of us, like the baptism of Jesus or the transfiguration, we can see God looking down proudly on Jesus and saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Or at the Mount of, of, of Mount Tabor, in the, at the moment of transfiguration, when he says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, listen to him. Right, where God is showering Jesus with his affection in that moment. And folks, we have those moments so often in our life. And I gotta I gotta bet that like myself, we fail at them often. And we're so quick to pass on the wounds that we've been given from our fathers. And we start to we think in some way that we're teaching and we're helping, but honestly, we're tearing down. Because all our children hear is what they didn't do right, that they're not good enough, that they never will be, that there's no hope for them, that if they'd only been better, if they'd only been smarter, if they'd only been faster, if they'd only been quicker, right? If they'd only been been a better person at practicing in the hours that we commanded them to practice, they'd be better and more pleasing to us. And therefore, they find out and they start to believe in their life that they're not good enough for us. And folks, nobody deserves to carry around that pain because it's simply not the truth. And look, I, I got to tell you something. Like I, this is fresh in my life because my son Jacob, you know, he doesn't have my height. I'm six foot eight. For those of you who don't know, and Jacob, of course, wouldn't be six foot eight at thirteen, but unless he was some sort of genetic freak, and he's not. But he got Angela's genetics, and right now he hasn't his growth spurt. But every other boy in his team and in his grade has. And so a lot of them are bigger than him. And Jacob wanted to play football. He's the smallest guy in his grade, and and he's not getting to play. And he came to me, and he was complaining about it. And he said, you know, Dad, I I tried just as hard as everybody else. I'm out there practicing just as hard. And that's true. That kid gives his all out there. He just simply is undermatched in size, but not in heart. That kid gives his heart every single practice, playing in Memphis in 102-degree heat and humidity. And he's out there giving his all and more than every other kid. But the one thing he lacks is the thing that he can't help right now, size. And so he came to me, and he was really upset and almost in tears one night. And, you know, I could have sat there and and just beat on him. And, in fact, I think I started to to go, well, Jacob, you know, I told you you had all summer to practice and lift weights and eat better and, you know, all this stuff as if that would have made him, you know, six inches taller and four inches wider. And I did that a little bit. And then I started, the Lord started to speak to me and go, that's not what he needs to hear right now. Right? He doesn't need something else beating on him. Look at him. He's, he's almost at the point of breaking and giving up. And I remember what it was like to feel that way in my situation when I was younger. And, you know, I told him something that I'm really, I'm really happy that the Lord gave me these words in the moment. We were sitting in the truck the other night, and he was playing in the fifth or sixth game where he thought he might get in, and he got in for a couple of punt returns, but he doesn't, he doesn't get to play receiver or any of the main spots on offense or defense that he would like to play. And he stands there, like, I wish y'all could see him. He stands by his coach on the sideline, each of them standing there ready to go in. He's not messing around or playing with the other kids on the sidelines, not paying attention. He's standing there at the ready, and you can just feel the desire in his heart to go in and to help his teammates. And the other night, we were at this game, and it was a close game, and they wound up pulling it out. And, you know, he, he walked down the sideline, he kind of raised his arms like, I don't know. And I thought he was going to be upset about not playing. But we got in the truck. He looked at me and I said, Jacob, I'm sorry you didn't get to play again. And he goes, Dad, that wasn't for that. I didn't care. That's what I was saying. I didn't care if I got to play because my team was doing really well. And all I wanted to do was for them to get the win and to enjoy it and to celebrate with them. And I got to tell you, it like broke my heart. It broke my heart because, I mean, in this moment, my kid showed me his character. And so in that moment, I wanted to lift him up. And I told him, I said, Jacob, let me tell you something. I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you because I know that it stinks to go out there and work just as hard as everybody else and probably harder because you're not as big and to get thrown around and kicked around and used as a practice dummy, but yet you're still willing to go out there because you got heart, you have character. And I told him, Jacob, here's the thing. So many of those kids are going to lose their athletic ability. Many of them won't be able to play in high school. They won't be good enough. And they'll lose things like that, but you can't lose character. Right? Like you, you can't lose the opportunity to continue to grow in that character if you just keep focusing on that. And that's what you're doing. And I'm proud of you. And don't let ever, anybody ever, especially the devil, tell you that this, this, this experience and this inability to make it on the field has anything to do with your worth because it doesn't. You have such great character. And I'm so proud of you because honestly, Jacob, I might have quit by now. 
Guys, in that moment, I had the choice to tear down or to build up, right? And and for years, I thought that correcting and hammering on them and pointing out what they did wrong and, and their mistakes would, would make my children better. But it doesn't. It just hurts them. And it leaves a place of wounding, and it leaves a place that's going to take them a long time to get over, and it's going to affect how they see their Father in heaven. And that's the most important thing. Because if they think they're not good enough for Him, then they're going to fall away from the faith, fellows, and we can't have that. Like, you can never underestimate the power you hold in your hand, the love of a father, the blessing, the gift that God's given you to just to sow life and goodness and encouragement and beauty and character into our children, both our sons and our daughters. That's what we're here for. Not to get caught up in our own mess and our own failures and our own situations where we're angry at work or we're tired or we're irritated or we're too hungover and we just take it out on our children. I see that far too much. I can't tell you how many men in men's groups that I'm a part of or help develop, they're struggling with that very thing. I want to love my wives and kids, but they get the worst of me. Everything else gets the best in my life. My job, my friends, my the things I'm trying to achieve, it all gets the best of me, and what they get is what's left over. Guys, we have a choice in that, but it's one that we have to choose in the midst of our struggles, in the midst of when we don't want to, when it's not easy I mean, there's a quote here from Father Lawrence Lovasek that says the very thing. He says, fatherhood is a vocation in God's service to be not held lightly or frivolously, but with a serious determination of serious men. Let me say that again. He says, fatherhood is a vocation in God's service to be not held lightly or frivolously. frivolously. I can't even say that. Frivolously, but with serious determination of serious men. Guys, I know it's hard to choose things other than yourself sometimes. It's hard when you've put in 12 hours in a day and all you want to do is sit down and be left alone to be a blessing to other people. But guys, that's a cross to pick up. That's a place where where our will meets the Father and we choose the good. We choose to be that person for somebody else and we choose to show those children things that maybe we didn't get to have ourselves. And guys, this can be said for our wives too. That's what JP2 said. It's for all the members of the family, is in the quote I read earlier. This is a chance to be that for our wives, too. Our wives need building up. My wife is constantly coming to me, wanting to quit grad school and talking about how hard it is to be a full-time mom, a full-time employee, a full-time student. And in those moments, I can go, Angel, I'm busy. You know, I got my own problems. Or I can say, honey, I know, but let me tell you how amazing you are. And let me tell you, let me show you what I see from a different viewpoint, from a different perspective. And I can't tell you how many times she's come to me and said, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know you have your own things and your own stresses, but the fact that you took that time to really help me put my mind in the right place, that's what I need. Guys, that's what it means to truly be a Christian. That's where you find the joy. It's not self-seeking, but living for those people that mean the most to you. And what I want to do now is, yes, I want to go to missions and do all those things and do them well, but I want to be here in my family being the greatest gift to them that I possibly can be. Because if I'm not doing that, none of the rest of it matters. And that's the way I invite you to look at your life right now. How am I living to my children? Am I doing what my father did to me or a coach did to me or someone else? And am I just pouring on just, just... you know, contradictions and and condemnations and telling everybody what they did wrong and how they never get anything right and pointing out people's mistakes and their their inadequacies? Or am I meeting them in those places and saying, hey, like, look, I know this didn't turn out as well as you wanted to, but let me point out some things you did really well. Let me give you some pointers on how you might be able to improve and be better. Let me tell you how proud I am and how much I love you and that I see you right? That maybe nobody else does in that moment, but I see you and I see your heart and I see your character and I see your desire and I see that you're good. I mean, to have the power we have in our hands and to wield it carelessly is a huge mistake. Many of us will never get back the moments that we've already, we've already done wrong. None of us will. But how many moments are in front of us? And I don't care if you're 90 years old and and your son's 60. I don't care if you're 40 and your kid's 20. I don't care if you're 20 and your kid's 5. We have so many opportunities in front of us right now, starting today, to realize the the influence and the power that we have over those that God has put in our life in a good way to influence them. Again, that movie, The Crow, one of my favorite movies to watch growing up, 
where Brandon Lee, Bruce Lee's son, is playing this superhero that's been brought back to life to right the wrongs in his family. And he sees this little girl that's hanging around him, and her mother's like a heroin fiend. And he goes into the apartment when her mother shoot up, and the girl's out on the street by herself, and he grabs her arm where she's shot up, and he squeezes, and he squeezes the heroin out of the, out of the, uh, out of the needle marks. And he says to her, mother is the, is, is the word for God on a child's lips. Fellas, it's the same thing with us fathers. Our kids will always look at us as we have a cape. But let's make sure that we're deserving of that cape. Let's make sure that we're living as the Father God is to us. And if you don't know what kind of Father God is, go back and listen to some of our episodes. Come to one of our missions because that's all we do is pour into that and try to help people reorient their identity. At the end of the day, we are beloved sons and daughters. And your child will never know that if you're not that image and that voice of God preaching that to them in their life. So please, look at these opportunities you have, whether they're moved out or they're still with you, whether they're young, like I said a couple of times already. You'll never stop having that influence over their life until you're dead and gone. So look at that. Don't mull in your mistakes. Don't wallow in pity for yourself. Make the decision today that you're going to be the father and the husband that you were always called to be to the people that you love the most and make that change today and start building up. Start encouraging. Start loving well those that God has put into your protection. So let's talk a little bit about how to do that. One, pray. St. Vincent de Paul has a quote that says, a man of prayer is capable of everything. We talked about how difficult it could be to choose others over yourself in the moment when you're caught up in your, your difficult things in your situation, in your life. But you could do anything through prayer because you're asking for God to strengthen you. So as St. Vincent de Paul says, a man of prayer is capable of everything. You want to be capable of loving your kids and your family in every situation and putting them first? Be a man of great prayer. Two, choose your children over your feelings and your current status. Stop in the moment when your kids ask you something. Don't react quickly. Stop for a minute and go, you know what? It's not their fault. They're not the ones that were involved in my bad day. They're not the ones that allowed me to be tired. They're not the ones that handed me all those beers I drank last night and I'm hung over for. It's not their fault. All they want is for me to love them well and have a choice in the moment to do that. So choose your children over your feelings in your current situation each and every time you possibly can. Three, look to build up even in the tough learning moments, right? Even when your children have done something bad, don't stand over and go, you're an idiot, you're a moron, you're dumb, I can't believe you did that, you're so, I'm so disappointed in you. Use the moment to teach but do it in love and charity, right? Look, bro, my son, I'm so, this isn't the behavior that, that we've worked on and that we've, we've talked about forever. And I am a little disappointed in you, but you were good. Just because you did a bad thing doesn't make you bad, right? Let's be better and let's talk about how. Not saying don't punish your kids when they get out of line, but always lift up. Don't just tear down and leave them there. Point out the things that were done wrong, but then encourage them and lift them up and give them the way to be better. Four, Constantly look to God through Scripture. Moments like the baptism of Jesus, the moments of the transfiguration, look at those and sit with them and pray and allow the Lord to love you as a father so that you can learn how to love your children. Those are some ways that I practice and I hope that you'll find helpful to you. Finally, let's take it to prayer because there's nothing more powerful than asking God the Father to help us be better fathers. So thank you for listening today, folks. Consider becoming a donor at justagotinthepew.com to help us move forward and grow. Sign up for the pilgrimage. Let's take all of these things and put the ministry in your very lives, my family, your family, in the hands of the Father. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Abba Father, fatherhood is such a gift, but can be so hard to live well. Oftentimes, we're caught up in our own mess, and we miss the opportunity to bless and to pour into our own children. Place within us the desire and the determination to be the father you created us to be. And Abba, when we find ourselves struggling, remind us to look to you to restore our identity and to help us to show our children the love of a father like you do. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.